for this meeting, the Election Modernization Committee is convening by video conference via Zoom on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. If you turn on your videos, others will be able to see you. All the supporting materials were available on the town website as specified in the agenda. The public is encouraged to follow along using the agenda. For this meeting, I, the chair, will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will go down the list of members for comment, inviting each by name to participate and provide a comment, question, or motion. For the public comment section, please direct yourselves to the to the chair and I will um, either see your hand raised or a chat comment and uh, we will attempt to answer all the questions possible tonight before we conclude the public forum session of this meeting which is intended to go no more than one hour. If it necessitates more we'll provide for that. So I'd first like to introduce our town manager Adam Chapdelaine, who'll give us an update on the town election preparation. Thank you, Jim. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm also joined here tonight by Town Council uh, Doug Heim. Are you? You mean? Can you hear me, Jim? Or, sorry, I can my, hear you. My, yes. Sorry, my, my my computer was giving me weird mute unmute messages. Um, so I'll try to give a very brief update on. Uh, the actions that the town has taken to date in regards to the June 6th election. Uh, but I think it's probably most important that Doug and I answer questions uh, that the group has. So uh, there's been obviously a lot of talk primarily about um, the postcard and the clerk's office, uh, working with the assistant town clerk, uh, worked with our normal printing vendor, uh, LHS, uh, no normal printing for the clerk's office for election related purposes, produced the postcard. And my understanding is most folks in town have now received that postcard. Uh, so just as a refresher, I'm sure everybody here recalls, but uh, this postcard will serve as a request form or an application for an early voting by mail ballot. Uh, postage is already paid or return postage is already paid. So all a resident and voter needs to do is sign the card, put it back in the mail, and that will serve as the request for the early voting by mail ballot. Uh, so we, we hope and anticipate that a lot of people will utilize this option so that we can have both a good turnout, but uh, hopefully less people at the polls on June 6th, uh, just to increase the, the public health and safety uh, of the day itself. Uh, we are also um, in, in preparation for uh, what we again are hoping will be a large amount of votes by mail. Thank you, Jim. So that, that's a picture of the postcard. Um, we are putting three drop boxes out in town uh, not necessarily, not for the postcards, we prefer you send the postcards by mail, but uh, for the ballots once they are mailed out. So we're putting one, uh, there, there are the locations, one down in East Arlington, corner of Mass Ave and Lake, uh, over in front of Town Tavern on the Winter Street side, one in front of Town Hall on the lower plaza, so not up the stairs to Town Hall, but on the brick portion of the plaza. And then in the Heights, uh, Mass Ave and Park, the corner where the clock is, what used to be Brigham's, then Diggum's, and now the optometrist's office. Uh, you see the sign right there is what will be placed on those boxes. And the clerk's office uh, being accompanied by uh, a police officer will pick them up at regular intervals uh, with the last pickup being uh, just as polls close on June 6th. So anybody who gets their ballot into that drop box before polls close will have their ballot counted uh, on election day. So what we're, what we're trying to do here is obviously make it as easy as possible for people to access uh, both the ballot uh, and then be able to return the ballot to the town uh, in no instance having or being required to place postage on either the application or the ballot itself. Uh, I should mention those drop boxes, people can feel free to either place their already received absentee ballots uh, into that drop box, as well as the early voting by mail drop box, the clerk's office will process and uh, pick them up and process them in the same manner in that regard. Uh, I'll also add that today, uh, some of you or most of you hopefully received this, uh, we sent out uh, a town-wide Arlington alert, which is a town-wide phone call 
uh, basically giving folks the update that I'm providing right now, calling their attention to this postcard, making sure they understand uh, that it is an important document. Uh, our hope was to, by getting the call out today, that we would avoid um, the card finding its way into the recycling if people weren't familiar with what the card was. Uh, so we're, we're really, you know, but via the card, via the call, via the drop boxes, and via the continuing outreach we'll be doing, trying to do as much as we can, um, really an unprecedented amount in making the town, um, town residents and voters aware of the election and making the ease of accessing a ballot uh, as easy as possible. To shift to the other work uh, that we've been doing, uh, and, it, and a lot of this work has been falling on the select board's office as well as uh, facilities, health and human services, and being assessed, uh, assisted by uh, Jim O'Connor as our sort of expert warden um, on the scene. Uh, we've been figuring out how to most safely operate the polling places on June 6th. Uh, so again, most of you have probably heard this, but we reduced the number of polling places from 10 to eight. Uh, so three precincts ha had their polling places moved and everybody who had their polling place moved uh, has also received a postcard in the mail telling them of what their new voting location is. Uh, and the idea behind this was to try to reduce the, uh, the, the differing amount of people interacting with one another, but also most importantly, reducing the amount of poll workers we would need uh, because we just, we, we're already um, needing to work hard to get enough poll workers. So we wanted to keep as minimal amount of poll workers as possible. Um, again, to minimize the interactions of people on June 6th. Uh, in terms of the physical layout, uh, we, will, we have already purchased plexiglass uh, shields that will be placed on all inspectors tables, uh, I believe as well as the warden's table so that there will be a shield between poll workers and those coming to vote. Uh, we will have uh, volunteers from the Medical Reserve Corps working outside, uh, guiding people and keeping themselves socially distanced while they may have to wait in line to enter the premises or even within the premises. Everything will be set up so that it is one way in, one way out, um, or not being the same, um, so that we don't have people cross, um, you know, no cross current people passing one another. You'll enter from one door, access your ballot, vote at the, at the, um, the voting table at certain intervals, those voting tables will be uh, sanitized. You'll place your ballot in the, uh, in the voting machine and then you'll be able to leave by another door. Uh, so there will be custodial staff on throughout the day, sanitizing um, high contact surfaces, sanitizing the voting tables uh, and basically providing a disinfection and cleanliness throughout the day. Uh, all poll workers will be provided PPE Health and Human Services has been working with the clerk's office to acquire all of that PPE. Uh, there will be hand sanitizing stations upon entry uh, and upon exit for those coming to vote. Uh, so we're really trying to make sure we put every possible precaution in place to keep people safe uh, during election day. Uh, I feel like uh, oh, an important question I know that will be asked and, and Doug can provide the, the nuance on this, but uh, Governor Baker's order does require that people coming to vote wear a mask. However, we're not necessarily uh, completely and entirely legally allowed to require someone to wear a mask in, able, uh, in order to vote. So we will have masks on hand to offer to folks to wear, uh, but uh, when, when I'm through, I'll ask Doug to provide a little more nuance on that. Uh, so then the final thing I'll say is we, we've focused a lot of attention on the postcard. Uh, we've focused a lot of attention on making sure that we can safely conduct the election in person on June 6th. And now we're gonna to turn to uh, how we best publicize. So I think the postcard itself is good uh, publicity for the election. Uh, the phone call today added to that. And now um, I'm not sure, actually sure if it's up yet, but we will be putting uh, a new uh, sign on the, uh, the tall sign in front of town hall. We'll begin to use the variable message boards in town to alert people to the town election. And then we'll also, uh, I know it's been suggested, we'll be um, working to put up signage at Housing Corporation of Arlington properties, the Housing Authority properties, and also attempting to put up signage if, uh, if possible uh, at grocery stores. So we're, we're gonna be doing as much as we can again to call people's attention to the local election on June 6th. So I, I guess with that, I'll stop. Uh, and if it's uh, okay with Jim, I'll ask Doug to provide um, you know, the, the accurate and uh, appropriately nuanced answer to the mask question. I'd be happy to have that happen. So let me, uh, Doug, you're already unmuted. Good evening, folks. Uh, I'll answer that mask question first, and then I'll 
maybe provide a little bit, uh, I'll maybe set the table for what I'm sure are some other questions that folks will have. Uh, with respect to the masks, the way that I interpret the intersection of these things is it's not the town of Arlington's position that a mask is required to vote. It's our position that the governor's order requiring folks to wear masks where they can't be six feet apart in public spaces uh, is valid and in effect, but we're not gonna uh, prevent people from voting if they don't have a mask. We're gonna try to make sure that there are enough medical reserve uh, Corps volunteers and masks available to provide people masks at the poll. And we're gonna potentially advise people that you know, you've got to wear a mask. I know that uh, APD and our health officials um, try to be as uh, generous as they can with respect to making sure that people understand what's in effect and not issuing fines. Um, the goal, if anybody doesn't have a mask, is to provide them one. If they don't have a mask and one's not available, the goal will be to get them to be able to vote as quickly as possible, as isolated from folks as possible, and to get them out of the facility as possible, the polling location. If somebody is uh, essentially, um, you know, intentionally trying to remain present in a polling location without wearing a mask, or they're not there to engage in voting, I think that presents a different picture. But the, the, the overall sort of story here is uh, a mask is not a prerequisite to voting. A mask is required to be worn by the governor's order in all places open to the public. And so uh, our premium is making sure that people get to vote uh, in as safe as a man of a manner as possible. So I I'm sure that there will be some issues um, come election day. Um, I'll be one of the people prepared to try to address them as they come up. But that's the sort of more nuanced answer um, to the question about requiring masks to vote. With that, uh, let me also just kind of uh, try to set the table for some questions. One of the things that I want to recognize first is that uh, the state and the legislature is doing the best that they can to help us engage in voting activities as safely as possible. All that being said, and I know there are a couple folks here who are very familiar with our election systems and laws, uh, this concept of absentee voting, or the, not the concept, the application of absentee voting and quote unquote uh, early voting in this context is a really makeshift um, uh, operation laid on top of a set of regulations and laws that didn't contemplate this situation. It's only by the special act of, uh, of signed by the governor and, approved, and uh, drawn up by the legislature that we're able to engage in early voting in the manner that we are, and that some of the rules are a little bit uh, unusual. I expect there are some folks who say, well, why on earth, for example, um, uh, am I receiving an absentee ballot uh, when I asked for an early voting ballot? And the reality of it is because uh, the absentee ballots and the early voting ballots are basically interchangeable for the purposes of this election only. And if for whatever reason there aren't enough early voting ballots, they are in some substance the same, and they can be used interchangeably for anybody. So as long as you're uh, asked for an absentee ballot or you asked for an early voting ballot, it doesn't really matter which one's used, only in the context of this election. Uh, some of the folks we have who are most familiar with this stuff know that under ordinary circumstances, um, this wouldn't really be considered early voting. This is early voting that goes up until the close of the polls. Um, the, the date of the election. The same thing with absentee voting. Um, obviously, under normal circumstances, there's a little bit more uh, scrutiny applied to the limited circumstances in which you can engage in absentee voting. Uh, the special act essentially provides a pretty broad cover for folks who want to use an absentee ballot. Um, basically, any reasonable concern about their health due to COVID-19. So um, those are things that are not, uh, every, every issue that flows from these things is not well spelled out in the special act. These things weren't necessarily designed to go together. They don't necessarily fit perfectly with the regulations that are uh, in place for normal absentee voting and normal 
early voting. So uh, with that, I, I'm happy to try to answer as many questions as I can. I hope folks will understand and appreciate that the scope of potential questions is really, really broad here. Um, so I'll try to be, I've tried to prepare myself as best as I can. There may be some things that I'm gonna have to say. I'll take some notes and get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with the public comment and questions section now. And uh, a few questions I received via email. One question, which was partly answered by town council Heim already, was we received our ballots. The question, or the language on them states that we can only vote absentee if we have a physical disability or our religious beliefs prevented or we're not in town on election day. And can we use the absentee ballots legally? I responded to that question by email. And in fact, because of chapter 45 of the acts of 2020, all voters can vote by mail, by absentee or early ballot. They're one and the same. And so yes, you can vote legally. Am I correct, Doug? Uh, you're, you're correct on 90% of it, Jim. So the answer is kind of twofold. One, the section um, four of the special act, uh, chapter 45, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, chapter 45 of the acts of 2020 specifically creates a new category of absentee, a uh, valid absentee voter uh, reasons. Uh, we have to get our ballots from the state. We can't just make up uh, new ballots that have uh, a new category in them. So uh, the ballots were created by the Secretary of State's office uh, before this would have been uh, passed. Uh, but the long and short of it is, is that yes, uh, there's a uh, sort of catch-all provision for folks with COVID-19 concerns to vote uh, by absentee ballot. The subtle nuance that I would um, offer in addition is that technically speaking, folks who signed up for early voting um, and folks who asked for an absentee ballot asked for something different. Absentee ballot, uh, folks who requested an absentee ballot should vote with their absentee ballot. Um, it will be accepted uh, with this catch-all provision. Uh, some early voting uh, folks may receive an absentee ballot instead of a early voting ballot. For those folks, either one will work. And the clerks are required to um, mark early voting voters with an EV next to their name in the system. And if folks uh, need a citation to it, it's again, the same special act, um, chapter uh, 45 of the acts of 2020, and I believe it's section five uh, C, talks about the ability to substitute absentee ballots for those folks who requested early voting. Um, and the section following it discusses uh, demarc demarcating those voters as early voters. So yes, you can use your absentee ballot, uh, for uh, if you ask for an absentee ballot. If you ask for an early voting ballot, you can use either early voting or absentee. Can everyone see the absentee ballot in my shared screen? One specific thing on section two is the ballot can be requested for all elections this year or all general elections or a specific election. And that's the big difference between your early voting um, ballot that you could request from the Secretary of State. Because if you ask for an absentee ballot, that would also cover the elections for later this year. And if, uh, if I'm correct, Doug, is there pending legislation to change the procedure for the remainder of the year? That's right, Jim. So Right, the uh, chapter 45 of the Acts of 2020 only covers election activity up into June 30th. So I believe that there's an effort to uh, essentially afford uh, similar uh, flexibility to voters for coming elections um, in the fall. Uh, but right now, this early voting um, 
the, the, this method of early voting and the uh, special sort of reason to uh, vote by absentee ballot are only valid through June 30th. Okay, another part of this question from this uh, individual was, we received our early voting by mail postcard. It states that requests for ballots must be in the election office by noontime, the day before the election, June 5th. They questioned, would that be enough time to get the ballot out to the voter by election day? Do you want to discuss that? Sure. So, uh, <laughs> that is what the card says, and the reason the card says that is that's what the law says. So the same act, chapter 45 of the acts of 2020, essentially outlines that folks have to be able to put in this request until noon, the business day before the election. Um, that's obviously a really, really short turnaround, uh, but that's what the law says. As you Folks might remember I said previously, this is one of the challenges with sort of trying to create the flexibility that we have here. It's a little bit um, jury rigged, so it's not, uh, it's not easy to uh, see how this is gonna be done perfectly in the sense that if folks get in their, uh, their applications for early voting uh, noon, or the day before the election, uh, we're gonna have to scramble to get those folks ballots but but um, that's that's what the law requires I strongly encourage folks to all get in uh, their ballots uh, the request for early voting as soon as possible um, I believe that the reason that this stipulation was made of the day before the election for the early ballots is essentially the same as what's covered for the absentee voter application an individual requesting an absentee ballot application can deliver it to town hall up to noontime the day before the election and allow the election officers at the clerk's office to give you the absentee ballot so that you can complete it right there. Unfortunately, uh, we don't know yet when town hall will be open, so the in-person options are essentially out of the question. Um, I received notification that one of our members, Adam Baddock, has a question. So let me unmute you, Adam, and feel free to ask. Thank you. My question was around the, the topic we were just discussing. I understand from um, what you're saying that everybody who submits a request for absentee ballots or for an early voting ballot uh, regardless of whether it's for an early voting reason or for uh, an absentee reason, is it, eligible to submit an absentee ballot that we're using those as the same thing. That's fine. I'm, I'm not troubled by that nuance at all. However, I, uh, and in fact, I submitted the early ballot request and received a, an absentee ballot, which comes with what looks to be an official uh, document from, I'm guessing the SEC's office, or maybe it's set by law, explaining the eligibility to submit an absentee ballot which as you pointed out is, uh, does not take into account the chapter 45 of the uh, acts of 2020, that creates a lot of confusion because I now basically have a document that says I'm not eligible to submit my ballot, that I'm totally eligible to submit and we all agree and understand that. I'm not worried about me, I'm worried about the voters in Arlington getting this and looking at it and thinking, oh, I thought I was eligible, but here it comes with this formal document that says I'm not. Uh, I guess I can't use this. I'm going to throw it out and I'll have to go in and, and vote in person. And now they're annoyed with the town and they're showing up on election day when we were kind of hoping they'd be able to mail it in. Is there any plan from the town to try to rectify that communication issue to, to make it more clear to voters that despite the presence of that language, that in fact they are totally eligible and that they should submit? I don't know. I, you know, I, I, it would be if the assistant town clerk here. That would be a, that would be great. But um, Doug, I don't know if you want to, if you have a sense of whether or not we legally can uh, issue such a message. So I, yeah, we we can certainly issue a message to folks, uh, clarifying that they're allowed to uh, vote with their absentee ballot. 
um, there had been a notice about this um, that went out quite some time ago. Um, we can reissue that notice on the website. There are other things that we can do. I'm trying to develop um, a FAQ response to post on the town clerk's page um, so that all these questions aren't uh, answered either in a forum like this or uh, by the clerk's office directly. The uh, issue, of course, is as you would expect that you know we're sort of required to put these ballots together in a certain way. Um, and again, um, the special act is what you know provides some sort of flexibility on this specific point. Uh, I don't know that every single one of these details was thought out uh, by the state. Uh, I think it's still very helpful and I'm very grateful for uh, the provision that they provided us, but it's, I appreciate your comment that, that this uh, can result in some uh, folks wondering whether or not they can, they can submit it or not. Um, uh, like I said, I think that from my perspective, uh, we can certainly issue further guidance on this saying, you know, you're uh, eligible to vote with this absentee ballot if you requested early voting, you don't have to provide that affidavit. Yeah, it would have been ideal if that came with the ballot, but even something that comes after the ballot, I guess, is, is almost as good. Thank you. The second uh, category of questions uh, pertain to handicap access. The question was raised, will there be designated handicapped parking for those that need it at the polls? Adam? So Jim, uh, we'll have to, yeah, I mean, you've, I may think you've been to every polling location, so maybe you could answer better, but I'm nearly certain each of the elementary schools as well as town hall have designated handicapped parking. So I think the answer is yes, but we can certainly confirm that. Okay. Um, the third category of questions that were received ahead of time uh, from Patty Muldoon, who's a warden from Precinct 6. Can each precinct get an electric letter opener to open the ballot envelopes to avoid more connection? Uh, yeah. I, I guess I could take that under advisement. I, I don't have a good sense of how much one of those costs. So I hate to commit to say, uh, say yes. I mean, it sounds like something automated will need to happen if we're gonna have what literally might be thousands of absentee and early voting by mail ballots. So um, yeah, let's see, let, let's, let's figure out what we can do in that regard. Uh, another question was raised. Will parking meters be disabled on election day? And I think the only polling place that'll affect is town hall. Um, so could you answer that? Sure, yeah. So as of right now, we have decided to suspend parking meter payments until at least June 1st. Uh, so that um, that doesn't cover through June 6th, but we have suspended them through June 1st. You know, sitting here tonight, I think it's likely that it will extend through uh, through the election. Um, we may, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll also weigh whether or not we just want to suspend it on election day. Um, on that Saturday anyways. But yeah, I, I think in all likelihood, we will, um, you know, we, we have two things we're trying to do, have people not touch surfaces that they don't have to be touching. Uh, we're trying to reduce the amount of people coming and going from the police department, which includes the parking control officers. And as businesses are gonna start to reopen, um, we wanna try to be as friendly as possible. And, and I don't think that, you know, the, the meters are there for turnover and I, my sense is as things slowly reopen, turnover won't be as hard to accomplish without the meters running. So that's a long-winded answer. Um, I, I'll, I'll take it under advisement and I think the likelihood is that we'll extend the meter suspension past June 6th. Uh, another question is, what is the social media outreach plan to recruit new poll workers since um, Patty was informed that there wasn't a full complement of staff yet. So there is no such plan. Um, I know the select board's office has been working as they normally do to recruit poll workers. I think as of yesterday, Jim, we had learned that they were uh, needing 11 workers. 
Uh, so the select board's office crafted uh, an advertisement uh, reviewed by town council and that advertisement has been shared. Uh, so I, I don't know what responses have been received to that yet. And I can talk with the public information officer about um, potentially sharing that advertisement on um, on social media. But as, as of right now, there is no social media plan for the hiring of poll workers. Okay. And then there was a further question. Is there a plan to train the new poll workers? I know we discussed that. Um, if we do have new poll workers, I think we should probably have some sort of a mini training prior to the date of the election. Yeah, and in fact, I thought we were going to do a training for all poll workers due to the unique nature of this election. So, um, okay. so yes, I, th I think existing and new will we'll put a training together. Okay, we uh, have no further questions that were emailed. Uh, you may use the chat or for those that are present, you can indicate you'd like to raise your hand or ask a question and I'll be happy to entertain anyone who would like to do so. Is there any questions from the attendees? Any comments from the attendees? Okay, hold on. Uh, I'm going to raise, uh, Micaiah, Micaiah Healy has raised her hand. So Micaiah, please uh, feel free. I think your mic is muted on your end. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, I just wanted to say um, thank you so much to, um, to Jim, Adam, to Doug for all of your thoughtfulness. And I know it doesn't get old, but I just needed to, um, it might get old, I don't know. <laughs> you might get old and being thanked for um, all of this work that you're doing. Um, particularly the thoughtfulness of the call that you did um, today and uh, getting uh, folks access to masks. Um, just really great work. And um, I just was thinking about the pull, the drop, the secure drop boxes um, and wondering if there could be some sort of sticker or some lamination um, or some message saying, um, to pastor buyers, like if you need a ballot, um, you can always, you know, you can always request one at the, um, you know, at the web, you know, Arlington, Massachusetts town or whatever, just to, um, yeah, just complete the, the process, the, the whole circle that if you accidentally threw away your postcard, or if you haven't requested it right now, you can't, you can still do that. You can still vote. So um, it, just an idea. I don't know if it's very possible. It's only three drop boxes. I know. Um, but just to be thoughtful about um, people who might have missed that opportunity. Thank, Thank you, Micaiah. Micaiah. Yeah, uh, Jim, I, I, oh. Jim, go ahead. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, the drop boxes in the community, will they be at wheelchair user height? Adam? Jim, do you want me to answer Micaiah's Please. first? Or, um, yeah, uh, we, that, everyone should wait until I call upon them so that I'm sorry. Adam doesn't get um, fuddled with too many questions at once. Please answer uh, Micaiah's first. I guess that would be best. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just, I just want, I, sorry. Um, uh, Micaiah, I think that's a very good idea. Um, I think the signs that say ballots only, no mail, have already been fabricated. Uh, so let, let me see how we can best apply it to the boxes, but I think that's a very good idea. Even if it's something simple, like you suggested, that says uh, to request a ballot, contact the clerk's office or, you know, wh whatever the, the appropriate, we can figure out what the appropriate language is, but I think that's a very um, good and, and doable suggestion. Um, to Paul's question, uh, I, I honestly, I'm gonna have to confirm that. They, they, they to my eyes, they look exactly like um, you, uh, United States Postal Service mailboxes, which, uh, it's been my understanding that those are at wheelchair height, but let me confirm that these are in fact um, accessible at, at wheelchair height. And related to that, um, I assume that they're of substantial size so that they can't be stolen. Yeah, so there, um, Jim, could you, put, could you bring the picture of it back up on the screen? I thought it was up there, but um, 
guess it was not. I was looking at it. Yeah, there. Oh, there you is. see it now? Yeah, so it's, yeah. a pretty, um, it, it's a pretty beefy box. I'm sure a very strong person uh, could, <laughs> could pick it up, but we're also securing them to uh, fabricated concrete pads that they'll be uh, fabricated to at DPW and then placed um, at their three locations. So I, I don't wanna be so bold as to suggest that it is impossible to remove them, but I think it would be a very challenging task uh, for a human or maybe even two to remove it. And well, will they Tim, be facing the sidewalk or the street? I, I can answer in, that, Adam, if you like. Yeah, if you know Jim the answer. Jim Feeney and um, Dan Warren from the Public Works Department have been working very hard. What you see at the bottom of the drop box is a brown background. That's mm -hmm. actually part of the concrete form that is going to be placed is about um, half a ton. That's going to be placed on the ground and then bolted into that will be the box itself. So they assure me that unless you bring a crane or your mighty mouse, you're not going to be able to move that box. And, and we'll Paul, be. Let me, um, let, let me confirm, Paul. I think we'll have them facing the sidewalk, but let me confirm that. That would be for visually impaired folks. That would be the preference. So facing in inwards towards towards the towards sidewalk. The sidewalk. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I think, I, given where we're locating them, I don't think that driving by um, would be uh, doable. So I'm, I'm I'm assuming it's inward, but I'll I'll double check that. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Our next question is from Kim Hawes. So Kim. If you could, I just unmuted you so you can ask your question. Hi, I was wondering about the number of poll workers per precinct. Um, that was one question. And uh, the, what, one concern is if there are only three, uh, as uh, Peter just reminded me, uh, it's going to be difficult to accommodate uh, breaks for the poll workers if we have a warden and two poll workers per precinct. Um, I, I hope uh, there will be enough uh, time for breaks or enough extra staff to accommodate um, occasional breaks. Also, uh, I understood you to say that you are currently short 11 poll workers, so that's how many you're trying to recruit. Uh, is that correct? So last I heard, we were short 11. Um, we, we do have an ongoing discussion about um, how many relief workers we, we want, if any at all. Um, I do think your point is well taken. Uh, Jim and I have been talking, and it seems as though wardens uh, can relieve one another uh, since there will be uh, mostly three except at one location, two wardens at each. Uh, and there only really needs to be legally one warden per polling location, not per precinct. But you're right for the inspectors. Um, strategizing the right ability to give people a break is important. So I don't, I don't know exactly how many more than 11 we're recruiting, but I think the number will be at least slightly higher than 11. Okay, the next question um, is from <clears throat> Johan Sonen. So I'll unmute you, um, Johan. Okay, hi, I'm Johan. Uh, now, in preparation for our election and potentially for the national election, uh, will the three drop boxes, just where we're talking about drop boxes, will the three ballot drop boxes have uh, cameras? so that there's a, at least a camera to uh, make sure that there's, if there's an audit later on, uh, that there's something to be seen. I'm sure the one inside town hall probably has that, but do the other two, and I have a follow-up to that. So uh, we've talked about the ability to place cameras. We haven't procured cameras yet. Um, so let me, uh, let, let me follow up on that. You know, there's a, always a balance between uh, the security that's obvious as you're suggesting and people feeling as though they're being surveilled and what uh, you know what that footage could be could be used for but 
let, let, let me see how challenging it would be to mount uh, a couple pole mounted cameras to, to achieve what you're, what you're suggesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking purely for the audit afterwards, um, if there's anything going on, like the, you know, the EAC, the election committee suggests doing it uh, just as a CYA measure. <laughs> uh, the second, the second one uh, gets to maybe a sticky, maybe it's not a sticky question, is uh, what happens when the clerk in this case is a candidate and an integral part of the chain of custody of the ballots. Um, and what provisions are being made um, to work on chain of custody uh, with someone on the ballot who's integral to the process? So the keys for, uh, the, keys for the ballot boxes will be kept uh, by the police department. And every time the clerk goes to pick, the assistant town clerk goes, uh, or staff goes to pick them up, they'll be accompanied by a police officer. Uh, from pickup into the police cruiser to drop off the town hall, uh, so we're we're trying uh, we're trying to provide that sort of that that coverage uh, to make sure that there is a management of chain of custody. Okay, and that's from, but that's from the drop box itself to town hall. But then there's all the you know preamble and postamble to that too. Um, I mean, beyond that, I don't know if Doug wants to chime in. It's an elected office that is also yeah. responsible for the conduct of elections. I. I, I don't know that we have any ability to divest the, you know, the, the sitting person. I mean, what, this is a unique situation given the assistant town clerk is running for the position, but you know, every three years, the clerk was running for re-election uh, and managing the election. Peace. Yeah, so, it's tricky. So I don't, I don't, I don't, Doug, if you have any thoughts you'd like to add. Yeah, I, I, I just want to let folks know that, um, you know, I did speak with, uh, folks from the elections division, uh, from the state ethics commission, not because anybody articulated a specific concern or complaint about anybody specifically, but just to confirm what is sort of a, what, what's sort of for a long time been an unstated understanding, given that what Mr. Chapdelaine said is true. You know, every three, three years we've had an uh, elected official running for the same office who's one of their jobs is to preside over the election. So there's no um, uh, status quo, I mean, sorry, there's no ordinary provision for having uh, someone in the clerk's office be recused or, you know, removed from some aspect of the duties. I think that uh, to some extent, Jim, you might be able to speak to how the ballots are actually counted at these precincts um, and that, you know, there are some checks and balances in terms of uh, you know, the uh, select board administrator has traditionally, you know, made sure that things are running smoothly at precinct locations with respect to not only people arriving at the poll, but the count. Jim, do you want to offer anything additional on that score? Yes. Once, once the ballots have been dropped in the box or delivered to the town hall uh, by mail, the, the clerk's office records them on the VRIS system, the Voter Registration Information System. It's indicated that the ballot, having been sent out, has now been returned. Those ballots are still sealed because the outer envelope, there's actually three envelopes. The white envelope gets mailed to the individual voter. Then there's a manila envelope inside that has a mailing address of town hall or it can be dropped off. Within that is another envelope which is signed and sealed by the voter. That envelope comes to us completely sealed. It's, it's never been tampered with. And that's why the question came up from Patty about a machine to open all these envelopes because we sit there with our trusty little um, opener and open one envelope after another. Anything that would automate that process would make it easier. But once the ballots are put in, uh, I want to answer another question that came up as part of this. Hong Chin, who is a warden from Precinct 18, asked a question, if somebody mailed in a ballot and then got an early ballot, would they be able to vote twice? And the answer is no, because once the ballots are checked in, the first ballot received would be the ballot that would be recorded, as far as I know, at the clerk's office. Once the ballots are delivered to the precinct, 
If somebody comes in to vote, we check the list. If they've already voted, then in the case only of absentee voters, and Doug, you'll have to add to this at the end with the provisions of the new act. But if an absentee voter comes in the day of the election and wants to change their mind, they can actually vote um, in person by completing an affidavit. Uh, I believe we now have our clerk, uh, assistant clerk. Um, Dennis, is that you? Well, I have to, it was by telephone. In any case, continue. Um, if somebody submitted two ballots, um, the clerk's office would first catch it and it would never get out to the polls. Once it does get to the polls, we'll only record one ballot. We, in the past, have had a few people that um, didn't realize they mailed in their ballot and then came in to vote. And we said, well, we've already received your ballot and it's been counted. And we can show them because we pull up the envelope. Let's just pretend this is Manila. And I look at it and it says, that's your name, isn't it? We already recorded your ballot. So there won't be any duplicate um, ballots or an, an ability to vote twice. Um, let me just see if Janice is, who's here? Janice, is that you? I've unmuted you. Uh, the telephone number ending in 815. Do you identify yourself? Okay, well, whoever it is, they're quiet. So, um, Doug, did you want to follow up on that? I just wanted to add, I think that was a, a very uh, solid summary, Jim, but I just wanted to add that, that yes, first section four of um, the uh, acts of 2020, uh, chapter 45 of the Acts 2020, you can, if somebody, there's, I think there's some questions in the chat, and I've been trying to sort of follow them a little bit. Some of them are getting captured by what folks are right. expressing otherwise than what you've said. Um, it is possible that someone asked for an absentee ballot, received one, and sent it in. If they want to vote in person, they can do so um, under the special acts, but they, uh, have to do so before their ballot is counted. To my understanding, uh, none of these ballots get counted until the polls close. Is that correct, Jim? Um, the ballots are actually counted during the day of the election. Okay. We process the ballots by opening the envelopes and the AccuVote machine treats them just like if a voter came in. We take them to the check-in, have them check it off on the list, then we go to the checkout, have them check off the list. So we have a dual checks and balances. And then the ballots are entered into the AccuVote machine and counted just as if somebody did it in person. I see. OK. Um, we have an expert amongst us and a member of our committee. So I'd like to unmute um, Leslie Waxman, who is a Cambridge Select um, or a Cambridge election official. Yeah, I can confirm that, um, as Jim said, ballots are processed throughout the day and um, with absentee in any election, not even just under this special rule, but in any election, if a voter beats, we call their ballot to the polls. Basically, if the voter um, came in person to vote before their absentee was actually checked off on the voting list, they still can vote. If they come after their ballot has already been checked off on the voting list, then they cannot vote. With early voting, usually the rule is that if you cast an early ballot, you cannot vote in person on election day. I haven't looked, I, I don't know if they made an exception for early voting, being able to beat your ballot to the polls for this election. I, I would be surprised if they had, honestly, but maybe they did. But um, normally in a normal election that has both early voting and absentee, an early voter, once they've cast their early voting ballot, that's the only ballot that can count. And for if you beat your ballot to the polls, then you can vote in person. I believe that that section only applies to absentee ballots. So I think your instinct right. is good. Okay, another question <laughs> that we received. Um, unfortunately, we don't have our clerk present. I did ping her and ask her to get on, but 
um, if anybody knows his answer, did the town clerk's office send out ballots in March for the April election since they normally send them out three weeks prior? Um, I had asked that actually at the last meeting. Um, Janice Weber had said they hadn't mailed any ballots out yet when um, they, when basically when we knew that the election was going to get because they were still waiting to get them back from the printer. So they didn't mail any ballots. I had requested, uh, I think I had requested my absentee a while ago um, and I just got it this past week. So they hadn't mailed any ballots until now. Thank you, Leslie. You're welcome. Your assistant acting clerk. <laughs> um, another question is, are we getting the new machines for this election or for the next election? And my understanding is that the requisition for the new machines won't be here until the September primary. I had Dr. asked this. Adam, can you answer that? Or Greg? Yeah, I had asked this at a previous meeting and Janice said that while they had the new machines, they made a decision to not utilize them for the town election to wait until the September prim uh, state primary. Okay. Okay, does anyone else have a question or would like to express an opinion of sorts? Uh, first Jennifer person I Seuss see is, is Jennifer Seuss. Let's go ahead, Jennifer. Hi, um, I have actually two questions, um, one quick. Um, <coughs> so we're cutting down the number of poll workers by half. So usually you'd have two people to check you in and then two people check you out. And I was wondering if there are any security worries about having only one person in each role. Is that, is that, is the reason that we normally have two people because of volume or for security issues? Well, um, I think part of the provisions is because with a primary, we have a representative of both the Republican and the Democratic Party or someone who was unenrolled. So there aren't two people um, that are from one party. Um, there certainly is a benefit to having two inspectors at the check-in because as the people check in, then the other person at the table not only is observing that, but also hands out a ballot and offers a privacy sleeve. I don't, and a magnifier if they need that. <clears throat> but many times when we've had workers on breaks and we don't have relief, we've been able to accomplish it with one person. But uh, Doug, do you want to tackle that? Actually, I have another thing for Doug. I, okay. I've been told that there's sort of some, you know, concerns about using the chat feature for public meetings, if you also want to talk about that quickly. Sure. So let me, let me answer the election piece of it first. And here's all I can say with respect. I'm not, a, I'm not an election worker. Um, I've never worked in the town clerk's office, so I appreciate the wonderful expertise that Jim, Leslie, and a lot of the folks here bring their, their experience and expertise working at the polls and supervising pieces of our elections. Um, and I know there's a bunch of other folks on here who also work as wardens and in other capacities. Um, I did speak with uh, Michelle Tassinari of, um, from the Secretary of State's office, who's the legal counsel. We had a robust and sometimes uh, tense discussion about um, consolidating precincts, about how many poll workers are necessary, um, and weighing those against the concerns of our public health officials are not something that we're gonna be able to have a, a, a perfect solution for everybody. I don't understand, it's not my understanding that um, this is a insurmountable set of concerns because as we've already talked about, we could, we're using what the law prescribes to be the required number of workers. Is it better in an ordinary circumstance to have more? I'm sure under most circumstances it probably is, but from a security standpoint, it also means that there's fewer people um, working at the polls, there's fewer people for us to sort of um, make sure that we've got trained up and ready to go. Um, so I'm sure that there's ups and downs to it, but I've confirmed that this is, um, uh, this is, uh, you know, an option that's afforded to us. And indeed, we could have either consolidated more 
or we could have uh, had fewer wardens at each location. With respect to the chat function, I just want folks to know that um, it gets a little bit hard sometimes to make sure that we're capturing the group chat uh, in the record and how we should treat that for open meetings. Um, whether we should you know, save a copy of the group chat as part of it. Um, the biggest issue that we have is, is making sure that people don't ab abuse the group chat, which is obviously not happening here. Um, I do generally discourage the, the, the group chat because it's not as uh, transparent as uh, making sure that all the discussion can not only uh, be um, seen and heard by the folks who are on camera, but also keep in mind that there may be some folks who are participating by phone who uh, from an equity standpoint may not have access to uh, a computer with the camera or the Zoom platform or Wi-Fi or whatever, and that they can't follow along with what's going on in the, in the group chat. So my recommendation is that you try not to use it. I, I can understand in this context why it's useful to try to have an efficient meeting. Jennifer, did that answer your question? Jennifer, I'll unmute you so you can answer. Yeah, we keyboard. can't hear you, Jennifer. Hey. Sorry, yes, thank you. Um, it's a keyboard issue, sorry. Okay, I will tell you that I um, requested that we enable the chat feature so that questions could be asked and I would have the ability with all the participants present, of which right now I believe there's 35. So trying to see everybody as they raise their hand, you know, you can miss someone. And this gives me a little bit of order. And um, I did not uh, save the chat. There is an option to save it to the, um, the website. Uh, Zoom so that we can store it later. I hope it's helpful to know that the uh, that 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 uh, that we're that for all the folks who can see the chat, all of these uh, questions and comments have been addressed by uh, Mr. O'Connor in, in some form or another. So I, I I think we're in perfectly safe territory here. But I just note that for future meetings, that it can be hard for folks on the phone uh, to observe and see what's going on there. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Um, on your screen, can everybody see the page? It says elections and voting, find my voter registration status. No, Jim, no. It's, still, it's still just your directory. Okay, hold on. There you go. There you go. Okay. This is a very useful page. If anyone did not receive notification via a card requesting that they um, know about and can apply for an, app, uh, an early ballot, the state website, Secretary Galvin has done an incredible job in enabling people to check their voter status. Now on this page, all you need do is put in your first and last name, your birth date and the zip code with which you last registered you can then in fact confirm your voter status and learn where your precinct is and information about it. I gathered information about this to share with everyone here. Um, a big change has occurred this year with the Secretary of State's office as well through the Registry of Motor Vehicles. If you change your registration address, it's an opt-out option where you have to opt out, have a notification to your local municipality as to the change of your address. And right now, that means that once you change your address, your town will be notified that you've moved, new town will be notified and they'll automatically add you to their voter list. You still need to get a notification by acknowledgement, which should come in two to three weeks from that date. And uh, <clears throat> confirming that the registrar in Arlington has posted your name to the voter list. 
but there are various resources. And so I placed them up here. Um, uh, wait a minute, we just got a new person. Greg, can you take care of the admin? Um, there's also an option and this is an exciting opportunity for young members of the high school who graduated and if before the 27th of May register to vote and correct me if I'm wrong Leslie if they pre-register to vote they would be eligible to vote on the June 6th election because the um, understanding I have under the early registration or pre-registration format is those that are 16 or 17 can pre-register that information is kept at the town clerk's office and at the time when they turn 18 they are eligible to vote yeah you they have the 18 by election day in order to vote and then their voter registration will get processed um, Throughout the year, it will get processed when they turn 18. If they turn 18 after the deadline to register, but before the election, it's processed um, on the day that's the deadline to register. So then I am correct that if they registered by the 27th, they would be able to vote on the 6th if their birthday was January 1st or June 1st? Yes, yes. Okay. Turned 18 by, by election day. Okay, so there's also some pages. I'll try to see if we can put them up on the town website uh, as a reflector of features that the town offers, or the, the Secretary of State offers. Because of the fact that the town hall is closed, it makes it much easier to use the online registration form. The only requirement that you have to have to register online is that you have to have a driver's license to submit for verification and absent of that your name on the voter list will be indicated you need to show an ID in order to vote and we do that um, very frequently with new voters. Can I clarify at, uh, that please? Table. What? <laughs> Can I clarify that? Sure, you need please. a you need a RMV ID, driver's license, or a state ID, or a permit in order to register to vote online. But in order to register to vote by mail, you can just use the last four digits of your social security number. You don't need to have an RMV ID. Oh, okay. So I furnish, I put these up so that perhaps it might serve some purpose for people that would like to share this information with others. Um, are there any more questions before we conclude the answer and question part of this um, meeting? Okay then. Well, we still have a few agenda items to uh, complete. So let me just put that back up. And uh, I thank you, uh, Adam and Doug, for your uh, presence at the meeting and for your assistance in answering all these questions. And uh, I did appreciate the reverse 911 that went out today to all residents to let them know that there was a postcard that should have been received to um, request an, an early ballot. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Doug. That, yeah, thank you. I just want to say thank you. And uh, it's um, pretty normal uh, that uh, all of us get the benefit of wonderful uh, volunteers in Arlington who are uh, smart and constructive. Uh, so it's not abnormal, uh, but this uh, group has been particularly helpful in what's been a very unusual and trying circumstance. So I appreciate all the hard work by all the folks on the Election Modernization Committee, a lot of the folks who have just been submitting questions and comments to help us, you know, uh, sharpen our pencils and try to, try to do the best job we can. Thank you guys. Thank you. So we welcome you to stay on, uh, but at this time I'm gonna call upon our um, expert survey manager, 
uh, Maxwell Palmer, who's going to give a presentation on the results of the survey. And so, uh, Max, uh, you can share your screen now. All right. Um, I'm just going to share a couple um, quick results with all of you, which are going to look very familiar to what we saw back in January or February. Um, the only real difference to what we have here is that we now have the full complete survey data. So about twice as many uh, respondents as we had um, before. The first thing to dial in on are sort of difficulties of polling places. And here I've broken it down and consolidated precincts into the actual locations where they vote. Um, and if these are too small to read on your screens now, I'll send them. Um, uh, I'll send them out to be distributed uh, after the meeting. Um, Chestnut Matter and Pierce, just like last time, stand out to us as problem polling places or polling places where people are reporting more problems, especially parking and location. Um, generally very low numbers, very low number of people um, reporting any issues at all. Um, but when they do, it tends to be about um, parking uh, by far more common than anything else as we see uh, in this top panel. But again, the top of this axis is about 10, 15%. So not overwhelming, but the most common. Um, so that's just breaking it down across locations. Uh, as I said, Chestnut Manor and Pierce being the only ones that really stand out um, there. We can also look at things overall by age. I know this one is very small to read on the shared Zoom screen. Um, overall across each age group, um, relatively low levels of difficulty um, are being reported. Um, majorities of people saying no difficulty um, at all in each age group location, parking, um, and polling hours stand out as the most common issues um, across groups with a little bit of variation there. Um, I'll send out all through some sort of top line numbers um, for all of this as well. Um, and then the third thing we looked at, and this is the same result essentially as we saw in February is looking at support for lowering the voting age. And uh, let me see if I can make this easier to read on uh, that one. Um, Overall, among about 25% of people don't have any opinion on this, 50% are opposed and 25% support it. Uh, when you break it up by age group, the only um, young people 18 to 24 uh, do support it. People 25 to 34 about split. Everybody else, a majority is opposed uh, to lowering the voting age. And just to note, most respondents in the survey tend to be in these older age categories. There's a very, very small number of 18 to 24 year olds uh, compared to any other age group here. Um, there's also some comments that I think are worth um, maybe looking into a little bit at future meetings, um, so, sort of particular circumstances and issues, but worth um, going through a little bit uh, in the future. Uh, but overall from these questions, we're seeing you know, definitely a couple polling places that should be thought about in terms of issues of getting there and parking and all. Um, but Overall, I think generally people having good experiences voting in Arlington. That's an excellent presentation. Thank you, uh, Max. Do any members of the committee have a question of Max that you'd like to raise? Leslie? I don't have any questions, no. Okay. I'm going to unmute the members so that, uh, you know, just be patient if uh, somebody's talking and that way you can have a free form here. Walter, do you have any questions? Nothing. Nice job. Jennifer? No, I'm fine. No question. Thanks. Paul? No, I don't have any questions. Bill? Logan? No, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jim. Is there anybody that I missed? Jim. Um, Just, I don't have any questions. I think it was awesome. Yeah, no, Jim. This, you, this, uh, Adam, this I think nice. Adam has a question. Uh, oh, yes. I, Patrick. Uh, I, go ahead, Patrick. 
I am trying to trying to Adam has got a question. I was just trying to get your attention. <laughs> what? Adam Okay, go ahead, Adam. Sorry. Has a question. Thanks. I actually I, I ha I'd like to be able to look at the, the, the information and think about it a little. Can we table questions for the next meeting? Is that is that something give us all a little bit of time to look at the information that Max put together? Sure. Sure. I just thought we had time before our conclusion. Yeah, no, I just I there was a lot of information that just went by very quickly. It's a lot sure. of process. Yeah. Um, I just try to be quick because it's really the exact same results that we saw a few months ago. Getting the other half of the data pretty much changed nothing from what we'd seen before. You'll understand if I say a lot has happened in the last few months. <laughs> yes, it, 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 in, in some ways making some of the immediate issues about polling place accessibility may be less urgent as we move more to mail and all. Yes. Right. Oh, Janice Please. has arrived. Yeah, sorry, Jim. My car broke down. I had to get it jumped. But we had a lot of questions for you, Janice. Well, give them to me. What are they? We just said Janice will take care of it. Oh, great. I can only hope. What was the question? Um, well, there were questions about whether the ballots had been sent out back in March, but that was answered uh, previously. And one of the members of the committee knew the answer. They said, you answered it back early in uh, either April or, uh, you know, earlier on. So mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll have this online. So if there's any further questions, does anybody have a question for Janice now that she's here? <laughs> oh, good. Hi, <laughs> Paul? No, no, I don't have a question. Okay. Uh, Par Parvano? Let's see. I don't have any questions, but um, I'm very pleased to attend my first meeting of this group. So thank you very much, Jim, for the invitation. I invited Paul, having seen that he was uh, interested in elections and has um, been uh, working with folks in Washington on um, issues with MIT. And uh, he was just appointed to the Disabilities Commission. And uh, Paul has been, uh, Paul Rea has been an excellent member of our committee, but to have interested parties that are willing to attend, I think it's great. The more ideas we can share, the better. Um, if not, we'll go on to the next agenda item. I have a one, I have one question, Jim, um, yes, which is please, not, Greg. so much of a question, but I, I'm kind of just interested what we as a committee, this is sort of a bigger question, but what we as a committee want to do about the polling place data and and how we want to act on it. If we do want to put forward some recommendations, it would be uh, in a convenient time to recommend that would be in advance of any redistricting that happens if, if polling locations are going to be moved for people anyway, and if our recommendations include moving polling locations. I know we don't have the power to move them, but we could put forth recommendations that, you know, along those lines and see whether or not they're accepted. Um, so I, I would like us to be, to put forward recommendations. I'm not sure the next step uh, for us to do so, um, but I putting it out there is something I would, I would like us to look into. Well, I, I can tell you one of the biggest recommendations or the most frequently asked of me is, will the parking meters be turned off the day of the election in the event that there are lines or that there are people that have to pay to vote? Uh, the town got it loud and clear when they put out the postage prepaid uh, mailer to everyone via postcard to request an early ballot and to provide drop boxes. But unless we're gonna go back to poll tax, um, why should we have people have to pay a meter to vote and then run out while they're exercising their right just to put more money in the meter if they only thought they'd be there 15 minutes and it took a half an hour. Um, are there any other questions or? Jim. This Adam. is Adam. Yes. Uh, I'm just looking. Is, is it 
possible, Max, for you to, to send out the report to the committee so that we can look at, at some of the more of the details? I, I noticed one of the things you pointed out was that parking was an issue, but you also pointed out that um, there was a chart in there about the difficulty voting in Arlington and that most people said they had no difficulty, but it seems like there was a big gap of people who, um, by, by not checking that box, did have a difficulty. And I'd love to see some analysis around um, how well those two things match up of the people who don't have a difficulty versus the people who do. And I know that's a lot to ask of you. So if you, I don't know how much you can share or what kind of report you can provide us, but if we could dig into that a little, it'd be good. Yeah, I'm happy to, to dig into that more and I'll send um, either some tables or something useful around in the next couple of weeks if that works. Um, and I'll talk to Jennifer because we were working on that report, sort of writing it up. Um, I'm not sure if we can share the full data or not, um, but we can talk about that and see all what else is useful too. I don't Great. see our town manager or town council here right right now. Um, they've left us, but there was another problem that keeps cropping up at precinct 19, which is why people indicated there was a problem, and that is there's a very limited amount of school parking, and the teachers are really angered by the fact that voters come and take their spaces and election staff take their spaces. So it might be a recommendation that we ask that the schools use that day as a professional teacher day as they had in the past so we don't have a conflict with parking. Um, go ahead, Jen. Oh, Jennifer, yes, from the school committee, please. <laughs> Yeah, I can speak to that. So, so the main election is a professional development day, but the question is, are all elections that? And I, frankly, if you made both primaries and if you made every election that we would ever need um, access to the polls, um, a no school day, uh, I think that'd be really too tricky to schedule. Okay. Um, I wanted to speak also to, um, to Greg's point, um, when we met a long time ago, and I, I could have my I could re misremember it because it was a while ago. Um, I think we had talked about possibly recommending pulling out a precinct at the two locations where there was difficulty parking, so that at Chestnut Manor, uh, you know, I, I know it's been a long-standing desire to move to pull a precinct seven out of there potentially. Um, and then if we could pull another precinct out of um, Pierce, that we wouldn't potentially have as many problems parking and getting to there. I mean, you'd still have public transportation issues, which is what people mentioned as well. Um, so that wouldn't go away, but mm -hmm. it'd just be fewer people there. Well, then we should be looking, since the town is eagerly listening to us, um, I think it'd be a good idea to to set apart um, some time to discuss polling locations and what would reflect some of the answers from the uh, survey questions as to why people had problems at the polls and specifically what they were. Jim? Yes. Um, as I understand it, um, the concerns that the, uh, the folks who responded to the survey had uh, increased as the, with the age of the responder. And I would maybe suggest that um, we think about talking to the folks at the Council on Aging, of which I'm a member, um, and uh, talk to them about what some of those specific concerns are for the elderly in getting to polling places. Um, and um, uh, we might from that discussion realize um, some underlying issues that we could punch into the equation as to where we want to put the polling places. Well, I think that's a good agenda item for our next meeting. Um, we have a few more minutes before we normally close. So I just wanted to update everyone regarding our warrant articles on um, April, or rather May 12th, the select board vote, or no, maybe it was April 6th, 
the select board voted to suspend all articles except for financial articles at the upcoming planned town meeting, which is currently scheduled for the third week of June, uh, pending weather conditions. And so that would be likely June 15th, 17th, or 22nd. And the reason um, that they want to abbreviate the meeting is obviously to protect everyone from COVID-19. And the plan is to place it out in the Pierce athletic field behind the high school and coordinate off so we'd all be six feet apart from one another. Um, plans are still underway for that, but so that that's the update on articles 21, 23, and 24. When I did talk to the moderator about not postponing article 21 so that we'd be extended, he assured me that we can continue as we have and uh, enable everyone to vote and participate as they have so that uh, we're not going away anytime soon. Um, so that's all I have to say about the warrant articles. Um, we do know that our meeting from April 7th is going to be on the ACMI network. They are setting up a special um, folder for our meetings so that both this meeting and that meeting will be on available um, files for some time long in the future. So what I was planning to do absent of any objections is to have that posted to the town website in lieu of minutes, unless Greg, you are anxious to do your usual job of um, preparing minutes. Um, I don't think I could do a better job than the video recording itself. So okay. Happy to. <laughs> do you happy have any do. other update on the minutes? Uh, no. Okay. Do we have any new business? Jim, this is Adam. Yes. Uh, so I, um, I, as I've mentioned before in previous meetings, I've done work with um, uh, uh, election monitoring where, you know, showing up at a polling place on an election day to, to help out um, as a monitor. Uh, and that has in the past been organized by a guy named Quentin Palfrey, who was uh, most recently, he was the Democratic Party nominee for Lieutenant Governor. He's got a, a long career in this, uh, about a decade and a half doing these sorts of things. And I asked him if he'd be interested in talking to us about how we can, um, the issues that he's seen in his capacity that we could be thinking about. And he thought that would be a great idea. He's currently the president of an organization called the Voter Protection Corps. I can provide you their URL. If people at this committee are interested in hearing from him, if that's something we could put on the schedule in the future, if that's appropriate, I'm not sure. Um, I wanted to offer that as, as a, a connection of, of having him come talk to us if people wanted to hear from him. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 It looks Aye. to me like a unanimous vote. All right, so, well then I, uh, I, I will try to connect you with him so we can get him on the calendar for a future meeting. Okay, great. Um, it was a question from Hong Chen, who may still be, he is still here, about whether or not um, I was going to send out info for election training. And once I coordinate that with um, Adam, I will uh, set that up and let everybody know when that's going to be. It seems I'm going to be doing that. Um, uh, another question from Elaine Crowder is, will the chairs of the town meeting be farther than six feet to allow folks to shift while this in the spaces and still be six feet apart? Um, that's a question for Public Works and John Leone. Um, to my knowledge, they're going to be at least six feet apart. Other than that, I cannot answer that. Any other new business?
Janice, would you like to say anything? No, thanks. Okay. I have a few other people that have been patiently attending all night long. And I wonder, uh, Julie, if you'd like to say anything. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to um, try to talk just briefly about the survey um, results, because of course, um, that's still an Envision Arlington project. Um, I really liked um, Maxwell's report. I thought it was very clear. Um, it's perfectly fine for you all if you can um, draft them in time. Um, we usually try to have the report ready for town meeting. Um, so um, you've got until um, mid-June uh, to go ahead and include conclusions or recommendations. They obviously they have no weight, but but that's definitely a place that it's fine to take to interpret the data so that the public in the future reading the report will go, okay, I, I look at the data and I can see. Now, and somebody had a question about the data, um, which, and I'm not sure what the question was, but maybe I can answer it. I think it was whether it could be given to other people. And I don't think there's any reason that it can't. But no, I think we, if we, um, we can make that file um, available to anybody who wants to dig in and do, you know, different research three years down the road, there might be um, more data to, to mine from a particular topic. Um, so yeah, that's totally fine. And in the report, we always include just sort of the, the summary report of all of the charts and graphs. Um, so uh, your section would just include your charts and graphs and how you interpret them mm -hmm. so that people get a sense of what you learned um, from the survey. So I can work more, of course, with, with Maxwell and Jennifer on that, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Julie. And, and I can provide um, for the committee some cleaned up data of just sort of the election questions um, that we care about um, in a different format. I can share, uh, send that around a little bit. Yeah. Okay, and great. Max, I, I will send you a draft of something. I, I've been great. in the back burner for a while, but yeah. Same here. <laughs> and as you may know, Arlington is part of the age-friendly movement. And a lot of that data has relevance to uh, the recommendations that would go forward with the age-friendly committee. Um, so I think sharing that information with, again, the Council on Aging um, would be uh, important to do because they will then be able to also be an ally in, in uh, developing any change that you would want to have. It purely from a practical survey standpoint, um, we don't tend to repeat um, sort of topics or question groups um, more often than every few years, but it's certainly, um, you know, seniors are an important uh, constituency in Arlington and their issues are very important. Um, and so if they had, they, that could be a way to get follow-up questions under sort of, um, if seniors are, are impacted um, by some of the voting difficulties or issues, then it's certainly a way to ask quest follow-up questions. Um, you know, would this solve your problem? Um, kinds of things in, in collaboration with, uh, with them. So. I think it's a, a, a way of starting that conversation mm -hmm. with yep. this data in hand. Great. So um, just to quickly say something. Um, when we we've went back and forth about the survey questions, one of the things that came up is that we might get some information from um, a qualitative information from a, a focus group that we wouldn't get from the survey. And I think issues on, and as Paul had mentioned, talking to people at the Council on Aging or talking to people in Disability Commission might be more valuable to us than, we just, we won't get a deep, deep diving into the data from the survey won't give us the information that we might need for that. Sure. Okay, allow me to answer a question Hong Chin has been standing by for a while and he asked a question about observers. According to the state law, um, we have to enable a place 
for observers at this election. Doug Heim confirmed that after I brought that question up. So, uh, Hong, I will be sending you a slightly modified schematic for the Dallin School so that we can accommodate um, observers from campaigns should they choose to have someone there. I contacted a couple of campaign managers who have said they're not planning to um, send observers, um, and one of them is with us here, um, for the reasons that they want to um, protect their campaign workers and avoid any exposure to COVID-19, as well as to protect all the voters and the poll workers. So that's the answer to the question. We have to uh, accommodate observers if they come, but perhaps they won't come. So is there any other new business before the meeting? Any comments? Let's start with you, Adam. I think this is Jim. Very good, smooth handling. Thank you. Dennis? I mean, Greg, Greg, Greg. Uh, I don't have any other comments. Okay. Dan Dunn, who isn't here. Sean isn't here. Walter? No comments. Okay, Walter. Thank you. Bill Logan? No comments. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think I've said enough, so I won't bother commenting further, but thank you. Uh, Maxwell? That's it for me. Okay. Paul? Rhea. Polly is still there. Okay. Uh, Johan. I'm good. Okay. Uh, Jennifer. No additional comments. Okay. Leslie. No, I don't have any more comments. Okay. Janice. Dennis, are you still there? No comments, thank you. Sorry, okay. I was late. Well, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, who was that? Walter? Uh, seconded by who? Second. I'll second it. Uh, Leslie, okay. All in favor of adjournment, please Aye. raise your right hand. Okay. Aye. 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 Excellent. I believe we have a, a unanimous vote to adjourn and um, I will arrange for our next meeting sometime uh, after the election. Uh, we do have town meeting coming up so that'll be um, a little compromising. Does anybody have any favorite days in the month of June? Greg? They all kind of run together, to tell you the truth. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll put out a, another rank choice voting option where you can all indicate which of the days you liked. Thank you for the compliments of using rank choice voting in that way. Okay. Well, then we'll, um, we'll conclude. And uh, thank you all for attending.